Welcome to the Jungle Room. And right now in the Jungle Room studio, we have Ian Mackay. Ian, where are you from? I'm from Edinburgh, Scotland. Wow. So you're far, far away from me here in Alaska. And from what I understand, you are a huge Elvis fan. But not just yeah. that, you have been very... I, it's a privilege almost to have seen Elvis live in concert at some very specific concerts that go down in El Elvis history. Can you let us know what those were? Sure. With um, 275 other European fans, we saw Elvis's last two concerts in Cincinnati and Indianapolis on the 25th and 26th of June, 1977. Um, so it was quite an experience. These were the only two concerts we saw. I realized a lot of listeners have seen a lot more concerts than we did. But obviously, they, these were very special. So tell us, let's start with the CBS special. Sure. And tell us how that came about. Um, mm -hmm. How did it end up that you went to see that concert? It's very interesting because the UK fan club boss, Todd Slaughter, um, I don't know if you've had Todd as a guest. He's certainly a, a bit more uh, a bit more excited than me. But um, Todd was always a visionary, and Todd Slaughter uh, in the he was he was a guy that in the 60s thought that Elvis should appear via Telstar, the first uh, television satellite. And so eventually, of course, that became a law from Hawaii. Um, what Todd did was Todd started taking fans from the UK and then from Europe to the States, really from uh, from when Elvis started doing live appearances again. And so it was pretty much an annual event that fans came from the UK and from Europe to see Elvis in the States. Now, traditionally, they went to Vegas. And in Vegas, of course, there's, um, they would get there and they would see a number of shows. And the, the tours usually lasted a couple of weeks. And they went to Tupelo, they went to Memphis, they went to Nashville, and then they went to Vegas. But these were pretty much um, lifelong ambition types of things. So I, I knew a guy, for instance, I met a guy when we started our fan club in the 70s in Edinburgh. I met a guy whose wife had said to him, look, take the money for the honeymoon. Take the money for the honeymoon. They just got married and go and see Elvis because you'll never settle until you've seen Elvis. And this guy was an ordinary warehouseman. And so that was the sort of money you were talking about, was life savings, if you like, to go and see Elvis in Vegas. And what happened was, um, you know, I, I actually met a couple of people at uh, dances. We had Elvis fan club events in, throughout the 60s and 70s. And in the, in the 70s, I met a couple of people who had actually been to Vegas to see Elvis. And because of that, I immediately thought, I want to go. But of course, I just started work. I was 19 years old. And it never occurred to me I could ever go and afford to see Elvis. And what happened was Todd Slaughter negotiated uh, to go and see Elvis on tour and for a much cheaper rate than going to see Elvis in, in Vegas. So it literally was at the end of 76, suddenly it was advertised to go and see Elvis. Originally, it was meant to be in New York. It was meant to be just said in New York. And it suddenly was, instead of being £2,000, which at the, the, the time was a massive amount of money, instead of being that, um, you really, it was down to um, almost a quarter of that number, a quarter of that number. You know, literally it was, it was within the realms of me going to my bank and getting a bank loan. So literally, I went to my bank and said, hello, I'd like a bank loan, please. And they said, what's it for? And I said, to go and see Elvis. And they said, OK, then, <laughs> because the bank manager, as you did then, you went face to face with the bank manager and the bank manager was an Elvis fan. <laughs> so um, that's how we that's how we uh, we got the money. And, and it was put together originally, I think, without really knowing that the CBS special was going to be being made. And I think what happened was at the beginning of 77, when Colonel Parker um, arranged for the CBS special to be made, I think there was a joint thing between, my understanding is there was a joint thing between Todd Slaughter and the Colonel to to make the tickets available to us for the tour. And so therefore, we were always going to see Elvis on the tour. And it turned out that we went to see him on the last two shows. So we knew the CBS special was being filmed, Jim. We knew that it was being filmed. And we, ex we were told we would be filmed. We were actually told we'd be filmed uh, for the special. 
And so at the concerts that we were at in Cincinnati and Indianapolis, we were looking for the film cameras. We were looking for the CBS cameras, and there were none there. There were no cameras. And at the Indianapolis concert, right in front of me was someone sitting with a, a movie camera on their shoulder. And so naive was I that I actually thought it must be a CBS camera. And it turned out I didn't see that footage until um, until uh, the Final Curtain uh, DVD box set came out, I don't know, about six years ago now. And uh, suddenly the, the footage from the camera that was sitting in front of me um, was suddenly available to me. Um, so I was able to see that. But So I was one of 275 fans who went over from Europe, uh, from France, from, uh, uh, from the Netherlands, obviously from Scotland, from England, and, and usually from uh, places in Scandinavia as well. So tell us when you're sitting there in the audience for the CBS special, was yeah. it different seeing it live versus when you watched it later on television? It's very interesting because the CBS special was actually filmed five days before we saw them. Okay. So the CBS special was, um, uh, the majority of the footage you see in the CBS specials from Rapid City and um, and Omaha, Nebraska is, was the earlier concert, but Rapid City was the, the better concert, so they used it from there. It was completely different when we saw them. And when we saw them, um, uh, it was very interesting because Todd Slaughter, again, the, the fan club boss, when he was discussing uh, with Annette Wolf from, uh, she was, I think, the producer or director of the CBS special. Um, when she when he was talking to the film crew, they said that they thought Elvis was very ill and they said, I don't think he's going to last much longer. Uh, that's what they said to him. And, of course, what he then did was he then told the couriers on the fan club trip, he told the couriers on the fan club trip, he warned them about this in advance. And yet, of course, Elvis turned out to be uh, quite quite the reverse. From uh, He was actually very up for the Cincinnati show, but certainly for the Indianapolis show. And what happened was the couriers came onto our coaches after we got our tickets and warned us in advance. They said, look, the Elvis you're going to see is not the Elvis from That's the Way It Is in 1970. You're going to see a much more, a much older Elvis, whatever. And, of course, the fun thing was, the fun, really fun thing was that because it was a cheap trip, because it was an inexpensive trip, lots of young people were on it. I know a lot of older fans who said, I'm going to wait till Vegas, and of course they never saw him. I'm going to wait till Vegas because I don't want to go to the States just to see two shows. So of course there were a lot of young people there, and the younger people had actually seen a recent film of Elvis. So I had watched, in, in Glasgow in Scotland, I'd watched um, footage from Pittsburgh from the New Year concert and I'd actually watched footage, I think, from March uh, 77, just fan footage. So I knew exactly what Elvis looked like. I knew exactly what Elvis was going to sing. And so when these guys came on and said, look, the Elvis you're going to see is not quite the Elvis from that, so it is, that the, uh, the fans in the bus started booing them. <laughs> they started right. booing them because we knew what Elvis was going to be like. But so CBS special, uh, where Elvis is wearing a lot of makeup uh, and the real close-ups, and he's sweating profusely. Um, I mean, I still love it. I still absolutely love it. But Elvis looked completely different from that uh, in, in, uh, in Cincinnati and Indianapolis. If you look at the classic Indianapolis photo that was taken by Paul Lips, that classic photo of Elvis in the sundial suit, he looks fabulous. Admittedly, it's at the start of the show, but he looks fabulous. And so in Indianapolis, Elvis looked great. It was good mood. It was his last show of the tour, so that was a great mood. And of course, the night before in Cincinnati, um, Elvis had actually um, been so upset about his hotel room um, not having the air conditioning working that he stormed out of the hotel room. They went down the road to another hotel. And, and of course, Elvis was really late for the show. And we were very concerned that, uh, that Elvis genuinely was ill and he would not appear. And of course, it turned out that Elvis came on stage and lied to us. He lied to us and told us he'd been to the dentist. They hadn't said, I stormed out of my hotel room. <laughs> but when you look at the difference between the CBS special, where Elvis really struggles, you, know, you can see that, 
And if you look at the film from Indianapolis, which is admittedly just fan footage, it's a radical difference, his, his mood, his manner. And so um, when I saw the CBS special in October of 77, when I saw that, I was actually really kind of upset about it because, of course, I'd come back to Scotland saying, Elvis was fabulous, he looked great. And and so I, I, I then was a bit embarrassed almost because of the way the way they always looked uh, on CBS. And I was fortunate because at Cincinnati, uh, we were at the, if you can imagine, a classic big uh, American uh, stadium, if you can imagine that, and we were sitting really quite near the stage, but over, if you like, just on the bleachers. And so I jumped over the, the wall that was in front of me and pretty much got up to the stage. And if you see pictures from Cincinnati, you'll see someone that's got a banner up saying, get way down Elvis and give me a scarf. I'm literally just behind that person because oh, wow. of course th that person knew that, that uh, Elvis's new single was way down, which I thought was great. So I said, get way down Elvis and give me a scarf. And in Indianapolis, I actually gave Elvis a tartan tammy. I gave Elvis a tartan hat, a little hat, a tam -a shanter. So I managed to give Elvis this um, by fighting my way past the police, getting beaten up by the cops with the truncheons. And I was very fortunate because um, there was big, there was crush barriers around to stop us getting over. And I kept on running up. And I ran up to the stage first with a, a tartan scarf, which I, no, I, I, I'm get, I get this wrong. I came up with a hat and I tried to uh, get it onto the stage. And I threw the hat like a frisbee. I threw it towards the office and it fell short of the stage. And a little cop picked it up. A cop standing in front of the stage picked it up, pretended to put it on his head, showed it, turned to his, his colleague, and then stuffed it into his pocket. He actually stuffed the, the Tammy that I'd thrown. <laughs> he stuffed it into his, his right-hand pocket. And then I ran back to my seat, again, fighting my way through the stewards. And I went and got my scarf. Came back, I tied two knots in the scarf. And then it threw that onto the stage. And it does actually fly past Elvis at, at one point. And it was quite near the end of the show. And what happened was there was, a, uh, there was a, a crush barrier up and I was literally right up against it trying to get there and the cops were hitting me in my chest. I was 19 years old. I was 19. Wow. So, of course, I was, I was a fit guy. So, 19, this cops hit me with a, a truncheon on the chest. Get back, get back. And the great thing was that it was such, it was such bedlam. I mean, there was uh, the extra chairs that the colonel had put in, wooden chairs he put in the last minute. They were collapsing. People were standing on each other. Kids were getting crushed. People were mm. screaming because of this was happening. And suddenly these two women tried to jump the crush barrier. They tried to jump it. The cops went one way and left me. So I jumped the crush barrier, jumped over it, ran up to the cop. I ran up to the cop who was in front of the stage. And I grabbed them, believe it or not, I, I mean, I'm from Scotland, so in Scotland, you don't get shot by the cops. Yeah. So I, just, I ran up to the cop and I said, I grabbed them by the lapels and I said, in my Scottish accent, geese my tammy. <laughs> so, <laughs> geese my tammy, what does that mean to an American cop? And I said, you, I said, my tammy, a tammy, you've got it. And I pointed down to, to his right hand pocket, which of course was right beside his gun. Oh, and of course, goodness. and of course, eventually I said, "My hat, my hat, you've got my hat." And he pulled it out and he said, "This is yours." And I grabbed it from him, and I'm screaming ah, 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 like a like a girl. <laughs> and I'm like six foot one. I'm six foot one with jet black hair at the time, at the time, and big sideburns, big skinny Scotsman. So, Elvis, Elvis, Elvis. And he comes along, and my half a second of with Elvis was he bent down, took it from me. But that half a second is stuck forever in my mind. And of course, fans that went to see him will know exactly what I'm talking about. He was so handsome. I mean, I'm straight as a straight as a die. You know? <laughs> but then I just I was I could easily have been gay then because I'll just I looked at him. He was gorgeous. He was absolutely gorgeous. And he's 42, but he was so gorgeous. And I'd no I'm colorblind. I have no idea his eyes were blue. And suddenly his eyes just looked straight at me. And he just looked gorgeous, and right down the front of his chest, his hair had gone into a pattern, right? So it had gone into this V pattern all the way down. And he just gave me this big smile and took the tummy from me. It must have taken at least half a second. But, of course, I then started screaming like a girl. And I'd been standing at the side, and I saw who is now my close friend, my real close friend, Kay Lips. So Kay Lips, um, Paul Lips, who took the picture, his wife, I'd met, um, I'd met Kay. 
I think the night before I met her at Cincinnati, um, and uh, I've been talking to her, and I talked to her in the Indianapolis show, and she asked, she said, where are you? And I said, we're at row 34. <laughs> and she, she said, I'm in the front row. <laughs> so I saw, when I was standing at the side trying to get over the barrier, I saw Kay getting a scarf. And she's quite a small, quite a petite thing. And I saw her brilliantly leaping up, finding the scarf, and stuffing it into her bag almost in one movement. And so, of course, I gave Elvis a pat. She couldn't believe that I'd done it. She jumps and started jumping up and down with me. I can't believe you did it. I can't believe you did it, she says. And then she, she hands me the scarf and says, take this. You deserve this. I said, I can't take that from you. And she said, no, take it, take it. You deserve it. And my mother had brought me up to always refuse these things. So I said, I can't take this. I can't take this. And she said, take it. I've got loads. <laughs> I've got lots of them. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, great. She said, well, you saw a great show. And, of course, Kay remembers, but I don't. Kay remembers, but I don't. I said I was going to cut it up and give everyone a piece. And, of course, I didn't. I've still got it. <laughs> you know? yeah. But uh, it was a fantastic experience. It really was for a 19-year-old guy to go and see that. So that's me for life. I mean, I'm absolutely, I, was, I mean, I was a fan for, for obviously a few years before that. But, uh, and maybe we can talk about that now, actually, just how I became a fan. Oh, yes, we definitely will. I want to get back to the CBS special because, unfortunately, yeah. uh uh, Elvis fans, the last look of Elvis is that CBS special, which EPE is pretty much locked in a vault. You can only watch this concert on YouTube, and it's probably never going to see the light of day. Do you think it was wise that they aired that concert in October, just three months after his death? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's easy for us to look back and say, you know, change history. Like like everything that's going on now. Hey, let's revisit that, let's revise that, let's let's get rid of these things that, that meant so much to us in the past and no longer mean anything to us. At the time, of course I thought it was a good idea. Right? At the time, I bet you the network thought it was a good idea, right? Elvis fans, real Elvis fans, knew what the guy looked like. Okay? So I think it is absolutely essential that that performance is shown, and I think it's essential it's shown now. Uh, quite a few years ago now, almost 20 years ago, in fact, it was more than 20 years ago, um, we got together and, and, and during Elvis Week, and we put on a special event that was just a bit of fun. It was a reenactment of scenes from Elvis's movie, Live a Little, Love a Little, and it was just so funny, and you had to... It's one of to my get, favorite movies. Get, yeah, you know, it's a fantastic film. Elvis looks great in it. Michelle Carey, sexy, right? What a tremendous movie, you know? And um, and reenacting scenes from that, along with the fantastic incidental music playing. And we, we were in we were in shorts. We we uh, we went in a dress a bathrobe. We had played all these sorts of things. We did it with our friend, my friend Kay Lips. And, and this was actually filmed by Australian television, believe it or not. And it was just crazy. We just did it for fun. But to get in, to get in, you had to say, um, our receptionist said, welcome to Radlake, Kenley, Camford and Penlow. Who shall I say is calling? And then you had to answer the question by saying, tell them Nolan is here with the truth. Or you didn't get into our venue. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think we had to give up because so few people knew that. But yeah. what happened was at the end of the show, we showed the CBS special. We showed three songs because we knew that Elvis Presley Enterprises would hate that. <laughs> and so we showed, I think it was Hound Dog and Unchained Melody. I can't remember. Well, Unchained Melody um, was available at the time on the um, – on. A, uh, it was available at the time. But we showed three, three songs because we felt people should see it. So in, in short, that's a long-winded answer to saying, yes, it's absolutely essential that Elvis fans get to see that. It's quite wrong that, that, that people think that Elvis uh, stopped existing after a war. Right. Um, and I wrong. think a lot of Elvis fans have a problem with the EPE stance that Elvis's career ended in 1973 after the Aloha yeah. special, which is totally yeah. not, not true and not accurate. Yeah. His life didn't end in 1973. Yeah. I think the biggest issue with the CBS special was his appearance because it is contradictory to what the reality was. I have heard it from Ginger Alden, the 
his fiance at the time, you and many, many others who had seen Elvis in 1977. And they have said that Elvis, that was not a, an accurate portrayal of what he looked like or, or how he acted. He was a 42 year old man. Of course he yeah. was not 22 anymore. So, you know, he didn't have that same 22 year old look, but he wasn't depressed. He wasn't obese and, and he wasn't lethargic. However, when you do look at that CBS special, it does seem to align with, that narrative do you think that just with the cbs special do you think it was the makeup do you think it was just a bad day what are your thoughts on that there's no doubt that elvis was responsible for the way he looked elvis you know um now it, now it's quite different now it's quite different a 42 year old man now is very unlikely to to have the same kind of diet that elvis had um, Elvis, obviously, to an extent, was was living with people who just reinforced whatever bad habits he got into. So Elvis was addicted to prescription drugs. There's no doubt about that. He was definitely overweight. He definitely was. Um, he obviously had a congenital heart problem. He's, you know, well, whatever whatever he had. But obviously, his 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 health was was not good. It definitely wasn't good, and he definitely shouldn't have been doing the touring he was. But you know, there's so many concerts, like from October um, 76, December 76, where there were some fantastic performances, utterly fantastic performances. So I think the problem was it was very much up and down. Mm -hmm. And all the stories we hear about having to dunk Elvis's head in an ice bucket and things, I, can, I really can believe that. I can believe it. But Elvis, no, there's no doubt, there's, there's an argument to say Elvis shouldn't have been on stage. But Elvis should not have been doing um, that special at the time. He should not be doing the special. It was clear that he didn't look good. The colonel knew he didn't look good. And I think it was pure it was pure money as usual to try and exploit um, what was, if you like, what the colonel, I mean, what was left of Elvis, if you like. That's, that's what the colonel did. The colonel, to an extent, made Elvis because of his exploitation. And to a certain extent, the colonel killed Elvis because of his exploitation. You know? But Elvis is responsible for his career. Elvis is responsible for the way he looked. And I I feel that um, the way that Elvis is portrayed in the special is not good because that is not the way he looked. And and I would I would certainly, uh, if I had been making the special, if I'd been making it from a, an artistic standpoint, I would have continued to film Elvis until I got better performances. That's the reason why Omaha is not used Omaha has hardly ever used because he, Elvis is so pure in it, and Rapid City is so much better. Now, if they'd kept on going, and actually, you know, like they would now, nowadays they'd maybe film, I don't know, seven, like, like, look at Elvis on tour. Elvis on tour, they knew that they couldn't just film a, a sh one show or two shows. They, they had fant fantastic um, uh, performances because of the number of shows they filmed. Right. And so any responsible filmmaker at the time would have said look the guy's not up for this we're not making um uh we're not making a disaster movie here you know we we are making something that's supposed to be entertaining and i think the the only reason why the special was a success in the way it was was because people had a ghoulish um you know desire to see it uh, but it's, but that said it is completely irresponsible for elvis for the enterprises to uh to, uh, to not let it be seen by people who want to see it. Right. Tell us about the, the differences then between the CBS special that you attended and also that last concert that you also attended. Tell me the difference between the two concerts in your opinion and what you witnessed. There's a lot of people, a lot of your listeners who saw a lot more shows than I did. Okay. And they will obviously have their own opinions. The, the shows that I had seen, obviously, on film prior to going to see Elvis, in these shows, you know, the best bits are where Elvis is enjoying himself, right? If you read magazines like Elvis the Man and His Music, which I'm a subscriber to, if you read that, just now what they'll say is they'll say, Elvis was clearly up for the show. There are three really good performances. So even though it's the same songs as the day before, he was really up for these performances. Even in Vegas, you get a midnight show, sometimes he's up for it, sometimes he wasn't. 
the main difference is that Elvis's demeanor, his sense of humor, it's almost, and he feeds off, he feeds off the reaction that he gets from the crowd. So there's no doubt that because in Indianapolis there was 18,500 people, and when he walked on stage, they went nuts, absolutely nuts. And it's just fantastic. Those people who haven't had the chance to see Elvis in concert, if you remember that classic scene in On Tour, classic scene in On Tour, where all the flash bulbs go off at once. Now, if you're not from the States, if you're not an American, then you'll not have seen Elvis in that kind of stadium, and you'll not have probably been in that size of stadium. But it's utterly fantastic. The noise was incredible when he came on stage. The flash bulbs went all over the place. And so as a result, we got a 90-minute performance from Elvis. He was up. Somebody screams at him, can't stop loving you. So he sings, can't stop loving you. Bridge over trouble water. He goes in the bridge. I mean, this is a fantastic scene. You know, when's the last time he sang it? I think, well, I think he sang it in Vegas in 76, I think, the bridge. But it was like, wow, it was almost like beginning to be a request show. Right? I think he could have gone on, but Elvis's demeanor, his sense of humor, the way he felt at the time, that is the real difference between the CBS special and the Cincinnati, but especially the last concert in Indianapolis. Let's talk about how you became an Elvis fan. What was it? When did it start? When did you find Elvis's music? And when did you just decide, you know, hey, this is a guy I want to follow? You know, it's, it, it's the, the most interesting thing here is the difference between Elvis globally and Elvis in the States, okay? And my, my, my age, I'm now 62. So I became an Elvis fan in the 70s. And, and a lot of your listeners are going to find this really strange. I became an Elvis fan in the 70s, and I did not like Elvis's early material. Mm-hmm. At the time, at the time in the UK, and we, in the UK, Elvis was a chart artist. Elvis was in the charts. You know, Suspicious Minds in the charts. The Wonder View was number one in the UK for five weeks. So every week we got the Wonder View on the, the only television show that existed, Top of the Pops. Then I Just Can't Help Believing came out, and that's the one that flipped me. I Just Can't Help Believing. That's the first Elvis single I bought. I couldn't believe it. It's the soul. It's the soul in his voice. Up to then, I suppose I'd like the stuff I'd liked, Tama Motown, I loved the Jackson 5, um, the Jackson 5, the Four Tops, I'd liked all these sort of, you know, I liked that kind of music, it was really cool. And then Elvis came out, I just can't help believing, and I couldn't believe it, it's the soul in his voice, it's just utterly fabulous. And remember, we didn't see Elvis, we didn't see him, we saw a picture of him, but then it just kind of blew up, wow, always on my mind, you know, Raised on Rock, uh, my boy, and probably my favorite, T-R-O-U-B-L-E. And all these are, they're all chart songs. So once you hear Just Can't Help Believing, you think, wow, I'm, I'm going to go and find out a bit more about this guy. So I, I went and bought some singles because I was at school. You know, I was at school, I was 13. So I bought, bought some singles. I couldn't afford to buy albums. Uh, I had a paper round. <laughs> if, I, if I could buy one single every three weeks, it was a big deal. But always in my mind fantastic fantastic record you know and of course we never heard the willie nelson in the uk so yeah. if you say always in my mind then it's, it's elvis or the pet shop boys nowadays but you know so elvis was a chart artist in the, in the 70s in the uk so lots of us of that era of that era and indeed a lot of the people who went to see elvis in the in cincinnati and indianapolis with me as young people they had grown up liking david bowie right um, Bruce Springsteen, Elvis, almost in equal measure. You get a lot of fans in the UK who like Bowie and Springsteen, who are you know who are almost as keen on all three of them. And so, it's a very unusual thing in the UK because the people that became fans, obviously, who discovered Elvis after Elvis died, they discovered them. They they they're almost coming from a 1956 standpoint. They're almost coming from a rock and roll standpoint. Okay, now I like rock and roll, traditional rock and roll, like Little Richard, Jerry Lee, and whatever, um, and Gene Vincent. I like all these guys, but with Elvis, it was it was Elvis music. It wasn't rock and roll, and so in the UK, there's a whole generation of fans who became fans in the 70s, and I was exactly the same as that. So buy the single, get a couple of singles, and then my girlfriend bought me an Elvis annual when I was 14. Bought me an Elvis annual. Um, 
and from that I discovered Elvis Monthly, the um, the magazine that came out in the UK, and from Elvis Monthly, it then one day it listed all the Elvis branch leaders, and this is something that's unique, to, I think, to the UK. And there was a branch leader uh, who was actually not far, um, you know, 10 miles from my house, but I was, I was at school. So I wrote the guy a letter, and he, he arrived at my house, and and he was astonished to find out I was a schoolboy. Uh, but he said, well, we go to we go to dances in Glasgow. So I'm in Edinburgh in a, a council housing scheme, what you what you call social housing. And so for me to travel to Glasgow was quite a big deal because we just had public transport. There was no, we didn't, no cars. And so um, one Friday night, we went through to Glasgow um, and I borrowed my brother's uh, cream high-waisted bell-bottom trousers. My, I borrowed my brother's um, paisley pattern shirt and my my brother's uh, platform shoes, even though I was already six foot one. And with my big sideburns, we got on the train and went to Glasgow. Well, we got two buses, then the train, then two buses at the other end. We ended up in Glasgow at um, a, a local council hall. And and there was posters of Elvis up on the wall. And suddenly we were dancing to Elvis music. And so, and that's 1974 probably. And that, that, that uh, fan club in Glasgow has been going since 1967. Wow. And it's still and it's still now going. And they've got a dance every single month. And and they've been going since 1967. So I, I went. And that's what, once I started mixing with, with the Elvis fans at the Elvis dances, I started going to film shows. And we saw, that's when we first saw Elvis doing, uh, I saw Aloha before it was ever shown in the UK. Um, a guy called Rex Martin came around and showed films on a tiny little video screen. Um, and we saw a lot, we saw Elvis, Ed Sullivan shows. I saw the Ed Sullivan shows in 1975. Um, and it was just, it was fantastic. It was a scene, Elvis, Elvis fan scene. And and it's, it's changed a lot over the years. But for a while, um, obviously after Elvis died, we started our fan club. We actually started our fan club in Edinburgh. Um, two weeks before, we had our first event two weeks before we went to see Elvis in the States. And we, it was on the 12th of June, 1977, we held a film show. And and that's our first ever event. And so we, I was actually typing our Elvis newsletter, our Elvis Fan Club newsletter, the night the Elvis died. I was actually writing up my, um, my second concert, um, summing up, if you like, of Indianapolis. And we, we had actually booked... Our, our bus to go down to the Elvis convention in England, in Leicester, uh, in Nottingham, uh, was already full. Our bus was already full uh, before Elvis died, and people were calling us up and asking us to go on the bus. And so, you know, it was devastating for us when Elvis died. But then, of course, it just took off after that. And for many, many years, I ran, um, I ran the fan club. So I ran the fan club and cut long story short, 20 years after Elvis died, I then moved to New Jersey, where I lived for 11 years, and then came back to Scotland. But I, when I was in New Jersey, I was involved with fan clubs as well. So, so it's a lifelong lived, Elvis, yeah. When you lived in the States, did you ever make it down to Memphis to see Grace? Of course, of okay. course. Of so course, tell, of course. Tell, me that. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Tell me about your it's first really, trip to Graceland. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, my first trip to Graceland was in 1978. Okay. Because what happened was, I came back from seeing Elvis, and myself and my girlfriend, uh, who had my, my girlfriend's mother, had given me spending money for the trip. Otherwise, I could never have, I couldn't have eaten when I went to see Elvis. But Elvis was so good. This is, I mean, I'm talking about my, my girlfriend was 17 and I was 19, right? And this, this is, and Elvis was so good. I came back and said, we have to go back and see him. We have to. So we booked on the trip for 1978 before Elvis died. Well, Elvis so we died booked. in 1977. I know, I know, but we booked on the 1978 trip. Oh, I see. I, you before booked. Elvis died. Exactly. So in the six weeks, in the six weeks from when I saw him to when he died, okay. we came back and sent off our deposit to go in 1978 to see Elvis right. because he was so fabulous. Yeah. And so what happened was we went over in 78 and I think we went to Florida and then we went to Tupelo and we went to Memphis. And of course, you couldn't go into the house. You couldn't go to the house. You, all you could do was go to the gravesite and walk around the meditation garden and come back. And we got horribly sunburned and everything. But um, 
And the, the, in 1978, there was actually a strike. The police were on strike, and so the National Guard were in the street. So it wasn't much of a holiday because we were we weren't even allowed out the hotel in Memphis at night. But um, uh, that was when the first time I went to Memphis. But really, after that, I think the next time I, I didn't go again till 1992, and myself and my no 1987, 1987, I went over with my uh, girlfriend now wife. And Jackie and I went over to, um, really to the States. We flew into Texas and drove around. But n we never intended going to Elvis Week. Never, ever. Because, and sorry, apologies for getting this wrong, but I genuinely, in the UK, there was this perception of Elvis Week being, no offense, but crazy Americans. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we none of us really wanted to go to, to Memphis during Elvis Week. So in 1987, I went, but not during Elvis Week. And then my friend, who always went over from Scotland, he said, you're nuts. Elvis Week's fantastic. He said, the people are great. They're really friendly. And so in 1992, myself and my friend went over um, to, uh, to Elvis Week. It was great. Of course, we really enjoyed it. I made loads of friends. that are still my friends now. And then we went again in 97. I moved, I moved to the States in 97. And so every year... I worked for IBM, the big uh, IBM, the computer corporation. I worked for IBM, and I always traveled. I did so much business travel that I, I got Northwest Airline points, Hertz points, mm -hmm. and Marriott points. So every year, I went to, to Elvis Week from 1997 till I left the States in 2007. Um, every year, I went to Elvis Week and met loads of people, and all great fun. So uh, I've been there so many times. Uh, people is, always ask me, how many times you've been to Graceland? Yeah. Well, so what are your feelings towards um, Graceland being open to the public? Oh, I, think it's, I think it's essential that the Graceland's open to the public. I think it was, it was the right move. And we all wanted to see inside. Um, I mean, you know, the great thing is, the great thing is, Jim, the great thing is, if you're an Elvis fan snob, right, which I am, right, well, I'm not so much a snob as my friend Julian, who hopefully, hopefully Julian listened to this. Julian's a crazy Elvis fan who lives in Cambodia. And um, uh, but Julian was my first Elvis snob friend. And Julian was always one of the guys that would have no audio equipment signed around his neck, right? Because when you go to Graceland, if you're a proper fan, you already know everything. You don't want the audio description. <laughs> Right, right? right. So you have you have this little sticker that's almost like a badge of pride, saying no audio equipment uh, around your neck. And of course, you walk around and you try and hang back from the crowd. You're trying to hang back from the group. You don't let people move you along, and you have effectively your own agenda. So long before we could see inside Gladys's bedroom, for instance, we knew what Gladys's bedroom was like. And you used to do all sorts of crazy things. Like we've we've um, we went through what was it used to be Elvis Presley Enterprises office. We blagged our way into there. We sneaked into the car park, into the parking lot. We got out the back. We got out of the back. We pretended we were surveyors. And we got up against the fence and worked our way all the way up the fence to the back gate of Graceland that's got all the old original uh, CCTV stuff and everything. Yeah. So that was great. We loved doing stuff like that. We went to um, Audemars Drive before Audemars Drive was open. And we went through Haraz Casino. Their corporate offices are behind um, they're behind uh, Audubon Drive's house, uh, sorry, the Elvis house at Audubon Drive. And we, we blagged, we, again, we bluffed our way into, into the corporate headquarters. We parked our car at the side of their, their driveway and all jumped up over the, and looked over the fence to get pictures, you know. And it's great being an Elvis fan and doing these sort of things that you would have done if you had been a fan when you were a teenager in 1956, you know. Yeah. But uh, I would I would actively encourage fans to still do things like that. Elvis yeah. would have loved it, you know. Oh, so take it's funny. Let, let me just sorry, yeah. Jimmy. I can just hear, we'll just see one example. I, just one one thing that I thought was really great. If you if you watch a CBS TV special, um, if you watch it, you'll see the fans coming off the buses, and you'll 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 um, you'll see somebody holding a, a British flag up. With, and, and you'll hear somebody yelling all the way from Scotland, all the way from Scotland. That's me. So I'm yelling all the way from Scotland. Yeah. But what happened was they used, they used, uh, they made us do it twice. And of course, they, I had the Scottish flag up. I didn't have a British flag. I had a Scottish flag, but they knew that nobody would know what the Scottish flag was. So they, they, they stuck the audio on with the, the British flag. So um, all the way from Scotland, I'm there. And it was really funny because just a few years ago now, maybe five years ago, 
I was I was in Memphis just for, I think it was just one night. I think it was just in for I can't remember. Anyway, I was in Memphis for some reason very late at night, and there was this guy um, getting his picture taken outside the gate. And I, we used to always go at three a.m. Where before we went to bed, we always the last thing we did we always we always went to Graceland. And this guy it was three a.m. and there, there, these people were taking a picture of him. And and I said, who's this guy? And it was French guys, and I speak a bit of French. And these French guys said that this guy that they were taking a picture of was a guy who was in the CBS TV special. He said, he's in the CBS TV special. Oh, and I wow. looked at him. I looked at him. And anyone who's watched CBS will recognize this guy instantly. Because what he says is, and I walked up to him and I said, were you in the CBS TV special? And he said, yes. I said, so am I. And I said, and you are. I got a regular job in the post office. <laughs> and that's what he says. That's all he gets to say in the CBS TV special. They interview him. And he says, I got a regular job in the post office. And I'm standing speaking to him. And I said, I'm all the way from Scotland. And he said, are you really? And I couldn't believe it. The guy's name's Jim. I think he lives in Florida now. But it turned out, when I lived in New Jersey, I lived one mile from him. Oh, he lived. Goodness. I literally, we lived no distance apart. And he literally had a job in the post office and he spent, saved all his money, he stayed with his parents, and all the way through the 70s, he went to see Elvis everywhere. And that is what I'd love to have done. What these fans did, who gave up all that to go and fo to follow Elvis about, I would, oh, I, would, I would love to have been able to do that, you know? Let's go back to August 16th, 1977. Where were you when you heard the news that Elvis Presley had died? So I was sitting on the floor in my girlfriend's house with a typewriter in front of me, typing the final pages of our Elvis fan club newsletter. And we were playing Elvis music on a cassette player. We had the television on. And the phone was, the phone was ringing a lot because people were trying to get to go on our bus to the Elvis convention in Nottingham. And my girlfriend, and don't laugh at this, my girlfriend was putting studs into my jumpsuit. Right? <laughs> now, I hate, to, I hate to admit that, but I, when I was 19 years old, I did, in fact, have a jumpsuit. Like in Love Letters, if you look at the Love Letters album, you'll see it. And believe it or not, my friend Frank was sitting beside my girlfriend, sewing sequins onto his jumpsuit. <laughs> so, as you can imagine the picture, I'm sitting, I'm sitting typing the fan club newsletter, and my girlfriend sitting beside me, putting studs in. Frank sitting beside her. The phone's ringing all the time. We've got the television on, and suddenly Elvis's picture comes on. We had the sound turned down, turned down. So we suddenly turned it on, and there it was. Elvis was dead. Now the first time, the first time it was recorded, the first time it was played in the UK was I think on on the news at ten on on one channel. Now we'd missed that, but we weren't watching that channel. So it was a later one that we saw, and it was um, it was uh, the BBC, and we couldn't believe it. We literally couldn't believe it. Uh, we were completely stunned. But it's amazing. We went into um, autopilot, and so what we did was we called, um, and I didn't have a phone. I'd, I I actually went home that night back to my parents' house, and in my parents' house we didn't have a phone. We didn't have a phone. So I went out to the telephone box. Um, the local telephone box, and called into Radio Luxembourg. And Tony Prince, the uh, famous Elvis uh, dish hockey who had interviewed Elvis, Tony Prince was having an Elvis special on. And we called in. I called in from Scotland to say, the Elvis fan club bus from Edinburgh is still going to the convention in Nottingham. I think it was two days afterwards. And the convention was like two days after Elvis died, or three days or something. And... Um, you know, and I so I went in and said, look, the Elvis bus is still going. And so they announced that the Elvis bus is still going. And then, obviously, I started to get in the press. The press started calling me and, and stuff like that. Um, and they asked me, are you going to the funeral? I mean, I was, you know, a 19-year-old boy, you know, on a, living in council, <laughs> council house. You know, I couldn't know no way I could afford to go to the funeral. But also, I thought that would be crazy. Why would I go to the funeral? Um, but then we just went into autopilot. We started. We, we ran. We ran Elvis events, whatever, and I think it was—I think it was about three months later—that I suddenly burst into tears. I was with my girlfriend 
and we were in a shopping centre. And suddenly I just, again, I was just 19. Um, and suddenly I just burst into tears in the shopping centre. I've just remembered that just now, actually. And I've probably not thought about it since then, but I burst into tears. And it was just, I suppose it was a combination of uh, the stress, the, the fact that it had been 100 miles an hour since Elvis died. Obviously, I had a full-time job. And um, I just burst into tears. So that was the only time I was ever really upset. Up till then, I suppose I'd been uh, devastated by the fact that I wouldn't get to see him again. And also that a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends who I had come back from the States so enthused, and I realized that a lot of my friends who were being much bigger fans and longer fans and better fans than me would never get to see him. And um, so I think that, that sort of sums up how I felt at the time. What would you like this new generation of Elvis fans to know about Elvis Presley, the entertainer, and the ways that you have experienced in your lifetime? Wow, <laughs> that's quite uh, that's quite a question. Do something like some of these guys are doing on YouTube. Go and visit Elvis sites. There's a lot of people who have, have written up stuff on Elvis sites. Go to where Elvis was. Just go to go to a concert venue. There must be one near you. You know. Go and go and you know go and find just walk walk around Tupelo. Don't drive around Tupelo. Walk around Tupelo. Try and find the houses that he he supposedly lived in. They're all listed. Not 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 the famous ones. Go into the weird ones. Walk around. Try and try and sort of walk in his shoes a little bit. And then do something like go to um, go to places in Arkansas. I've been to places in Arkansas, and I'll, you know, um, places in Arkansas they always appeared where there was a high school. You know, high school, and and, um, and go and hang out where where I was hung out. Understand his love for black music. Understand his love for um, gospel. Understand his love for country. Go to East Trig Baptist Church, which I've done twice with my son. Go to East Trig Baptist Church, and myself, I was I was there once as the only white person there, and 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 you get such a warm welcome, and and. The, the guy, the pastor, actually said, we've got an integrated congregation today. And, you know, realize that Elvis, Elvis sat in the back of the church. Okay, it's a different church, but Elvis, Elvis used to go. Elvis used to go to East Trig Baptist Church with a few, a few friends. And they would go in and go to the white area at the back of the church and listen to the music they loved. Loved the music that Elvis loved. Listen to Roy Hamilton. Listen to Roy Hamilton. Listen to, you know, I don't listen to Mario Lanza, <laughs> but listen to Roy Hamilton. If you want to listen to, um, just listen to Ruth Brown, listen to Roy Hamilton, listen to the listen to the coasters. You know, follow the music they always loved. Elvis loved um, country music. You know, Elvis listen to um, Jimmy Rogers. Just listen to these people. You know, go back and try and try and just follow a bit of the the Elvis life. Go back and find White Station in Memphis, which still is still you can still you can still follow where Elvis gets off in the Elvis Fifty Six documentary. Elvis gets off the, the the train early at White Station and walks to Graceland. I've actually met a woman. I met her in New Jersey. I met a woman who met Elvis as he was walking back in 1956. I've actually met her. She was with her friend, and they were walking along the railway tracks, and they actually met Elvis on on that occasion. So do crazy things. Follow Elvis. Just just spend some time um, in understanding the guy, understanding him. There's nobody really left that really knew Elvis. Jerry Schilling's around, but you know, unless you get a chance to talk to Jerry, there's not there's not a lot of people you can go and talk to now who actually knew Elvis well. Uh, Billy Smith, his cousin, is still around. Yeah, and Billy's great. Yeah. Billy's great. Yeah. yeah. Billy. Uh, Billy knows. Billy knows Elvis. Yeah. 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 Ian, thank you so much for being here in the Jungle Room studio. I would like to have you back. I have way more questions for you, and I want to hear more stories. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Oh, great. I hope to have you back here in the Jungle Room studio. Yeah. What I is want to tell you, I want to tell you, I want to, when, you, when you invite me back, I want to tell you one of the most fantastic stories I've heard uh, about two Elvis fans who both met Elvis. 
and I want to tell you that story next time I come back. Okay. Okay. Well, how about you come back next week? We can continue this conversation and we sure, can do part that. two of this interview with Ian Mackay. Ian, thank you so much. I've enjoyed it enormously. All right. Thanks very thank much. You.